Welcome to another BitFlix.com podcast. My name's Stuart Wright, and today's guest is Yvonne Grace. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Stuart. You are here to talk about your new book, From Creation to Pitch, How to Write Stories for TV That Sell. It's a book that sets out to demystify the entire process of TV series drama development. Does that sound about right? Yeah, absolutely. I demystify. That's what I try to do, demystify. <laughs> you are a seasoned, award-winning TV drama producer with, I think you said, 30 years' experience now. Yeah. Well done, you, in script editing, <laughs> development and production. Creation to Pitch is your second book, your first, the bestseller, writing for TV series, serials and soaps, is, yeah. as you were telling me in the preamble, readily available in lots of learned places now and is a key text for people wanting to learn the craft of screenwriting. Yeah, it is. Okay. And so From Creation to Pitch is out now and is available where you buy books from, I guess, is the way to describe it. Yeah, I'll put all... well, I think Amazon and I think Waterstones primarily, but you yeah, can get it. I, I think they're the two places you can get it. Cool. Well, look, let's now let's start at the beginning then. You'd written a book called Writing for TV Series and yeah. now you're writing one about how to write stories for TV that sell. So what for you was this, what was missing from the first book that led to this, this second one being written? What was the instigation for you? What, where do you start? The funny thing was, you know, working in the industry as long as I have done, mm. I worked as a script editor and a way, I basically worked my way up. So I've always worked with writers one-on-one and often, often, often under a huge amount of pressure because that comes from being commercial. Yeah. You're in a business. You're basically... You know, my first script editing job was on EastEnders and you're in a factory environment. I loved it, but, you know, it's it's tough. You've got mm. to get scripts done, ready, you know, in at first draft, out at, when I was doing EastEnders, out at third draft, onto the production unit, get it shot, get it done, get it transmitted. And by that time, you've done another four scripts. So it's just total whirlwind mm. of production. Now, what you learn from there, from the ground upwards, without even thinking of it, I realized that's what I was learning, is that it's very good to write stories and it's all very good to create characters and it's all very good to, you know, talk about your writer voice and all of that, which is really important. But the bottom line is TV is a, it's a business. It needs to have a profit at the end of it. Mm. It's not, it is an art form to write good television is an art form, but it's also a commercial concern. Mm. And if you don't make commercially viable projects, then you're not working, you're not earning, your kids don't go to good schools, you don't have holidays, you don't have a conservatory. No, the, the list is endless, really. <laughs> so the, what struck me about working, about when I was writing that first book, is that years after I was producing and came out of it in 2012, I suppose, and then in 2000. And, 13, I set up my consultancy, which I'm still running now. Mm. Um, what I had to ask myself during that period was, what made scripts work and why? And why did I think they worked? And what was my process? So if you're doing something and it's not broken, you don't fix it and you keep on doing it. Yeah. And then when I was a consultant, I realized I had to teach people to use this, the mindset that I just thought everyone had, but okay. they didn't. They don't have that mindset. And that's what that book is all about. It's about opening my brain and putting it on the page so that you can get what I get and you can think like I think. Mm. And that is how you approach your writing. As a writer, I was fascinated by the section that um, that where you talk about the different types of writers. Oh, yeah. yeah. Studies in how people work creatively. Because before we started recording, I was, telling, I was telling you a story of how I developed some practices in terms of my That's own right. writing, and yeah. one of them being the idea of hope. Not every day, but most days, I'll do a I'll do a story to a picture. But that process of stream of conscious writing has now become a thing I do. If I get stuck with a story I'm working on, full stop. I'll I'll take time out mm -hmm. and just write three pages until they're full, and it allows me just yeah. to spit things on the page without worrying or right. thinking too hard. Right. I would say that you were a Jackson Pollock writer then. I was going to say that was that was that was my guess from uh, from reading your uh, your different portraits of of the writers. Yeah, 
And, and, but it was fascinating. Yeah. But but you were right from the point of view that it's not about being. There's not a correct one. There's just it's just no. from your point of view, it's knowing what type of writer you're dealing with, and and also for yeah, writers exactly. to and identify. All the time, you see, yeah, and and sorry, all the time um, when you're working as a development person, um, which is what I'm doing now full time, mm. is you're constantly thinking, how do I reign in, and how do I contain without quashing too much yeah. the creativity of this particular writer and their voice because what you're trying to do what I'm doing I approach my work as a producer you know with a producer hat on mm. I approach it and I say it has to be creative and different mm. no one can write your work like you can yeah. but at the end of the day we're trying to make something that is universally understood and universally accepted and universally engaged with and they're the elements which made me want to write the second book. Once you've got the structure in, which is what the first book primarily is about, how to approach the structure of series narrative storytelling. So many people get this wrong. Mm. And it's because they haven't done the work I did. So if you start like I did as a very, very green person, completely blagging their way into EastEnders and getting away with it, yeah, then you learn from the ground upwards. And, and it's it's... Everyone's talking their similar language. Back in the mid nineties, uh, I was at Granada Television, and I didn't realize at the time that I was working around the most amazing TV writers who really are at the top of their game now. Hmm. So people like Paul Abbott, Russell T. Davis, Sally Wainwright, these people we wow. I was working with on a one to one basis with a, as a script editor. Yeah, and we all had the same language. We wouldn't talk necessarily about acts or you know, but we would certainly talk about ad breaks because we were doing a commercial channel. We mm. were we were ITV, you know. So we were making drama long running, which had to be split incrementally across an arc of time mm. and also an arc of, of of transmission. So you're thinking, okay, A midpoint land point, you know? So episode one, episode six, episode three, episode six, mm. say. So, you know, so what you're doing with that and people like Russell and I and Sally, we had the same mindset. We talk about, I don't want to just tell a story about, and it'd be like this, like a film, like a single unit. Mm. I want to tell a story that's uploaded. We used to call it the, the front loading washing machine technique. <laughs> so you load the drama up front and then you're literally pulling that fabric out across an arc of however many episodes. So your mind becomes is, is used to working incrementally, mm. eking out, literally. Now, when you eke something out, you're trying to not diminish it. What you're trying to do, and this is, again, something we just used to talk about all the time, is building drama peaks, drill, building story to a series of peaks. Okay. And particularly in series narrative, you need to be able to say, right, that's my midpoint. Everything is going towards that midpoint in the arc of the series as a whole. Hmm. After that, nothing's the same. And so, so minute one in pilot, the first episode, is going to that minute in the middle of halfway through three, through, through the third episode. Yeah. If you're doing six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because yeah. nothing in TV is isolated. It's all to do with connection, which is why in the first book, which I do think you should read, actually, Stuart. It's, I'm not um, saying I avoided do... it. <laughs> it's just that you didn't get it. You didn't get it free from me. No, <laughs> no I'm, I'm being silly. No, I think if you everything to do with television is connections. So you're aiming for a necklace. This is the, this is the visual I use all the time. Hmm. Everything is hung, hung on that same string. The narrative through line is the same as the string. That's in my my land. Yeah. And each episode is a, is a is a bead, and it hangs on that narrative through line. They're all connected, and they're connected thematically and action plot wise too. And the other thing is, which is something I came up with when I was working on how to run a consultancy, basically, and get people hmm. to accept what I say. <laughs> Um, would be that that string, that narrative through line, is the same thing as the title. So if you think of Happy Valley, 
yeah. think of Breaking Bad, yeah. if you think of Bad Sisters, you know, they're, they're all great titles because thematically, and that's why I did talk about titles quite a lot in this book because it, in the second book, because, um, you know, it, it, it really is an indicator as far as I'm concerned of a story that potentially is going to be good for series. The worst ones are the ones you can't remember, the titles you can't remember, or the ones that are so generic they don't land. I mean, that's I mean, there's there's a, that, that that's that's a mirror to film in many ways. You know, it's like it's like you know, people. You look at a film like Michael Clayton, and if you see the title Michael Clayton, you've got no idea what that might be about. It could be about anything. Right. So you know, while it's a good film. Yeah, it, it, it's it's a hard one to market to people who no, don't know exactly. What it is. And I I I I equate film and the structure of film to be like a Christmas tree, and on it you've got all these baubles, and they're all very nice, but they're all separate. So in a film, you can have moments here, things there, a thematic thing there, a sweeping shot of a mountain for whatever reason, presumably theme there, but none of that is linked. Whereas in TV, you've got a necklace. So the, it's the difference in my my my. I mind. still think. I mean, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not here to defend film, but I still. There's still. No, there's, but it's fine. <laughs> there's still. There is still a, 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 a natural instinct to want to build to a midpoint in even in a certainly in traditional narrative. Not obviously. Yeah. Not yeah. A, where you reach a point of it's nothing's the same afterwards, but also you you kind of have the same thing of like when you reach the end of Act One, which I don't know what that would the equivalent of Act One is in a in a. Um, if you think of a midpoint being episode, middle of episode three in a six series, yeah, um, in a six series show, at, but in a well, film, at one would, yeah, at one at is one, like is like fight. is like you know, uh, the easiest one is Wizard of Oz. You know, you're no longer in Kansas anymore, so you can't, you can't just right. turn around and be right. in Kansas. Right. The thing is, though, the thing, the difference between film and TV, which I think is the main difference, is oh. the fact that TV, as I say, you know, the connections you're looking for all the time, but you're also looking for momentum, which mm. is why you have to keep building these yeah. the story into peaks. And um, not just in the episode, but in the arc as a whole. So you're never structuring something in isolation. You're structuring it with a view to producing a longer run story. Because like I said to you when we were, I don't know whether this has been recorded when I said it, but <laughs> it's to do with increment. <laughs> it's to do with increments, you know? Yeah, yeah. Everything you do in TV is incremental. You I, are literally I, 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 I'm gonna say I remember one of the penny droppings for me one of the pennies dropped for me was watching something like Sopranos and Breaking Bad. And what right. picking up on what you're saying was realizing that even episodes or sequences that weren't didn't include Tony Soprano or Walter White, you could tell what was happening was going to have a direct was making you worry or get excited. Yes, what, yes. So you don't have even though you've not got the main protagonist in the picture. Exactly. What's happening and transpiring, you yeah. know, is going to impact on them. So let's say that's you, because that's because three things are working there. Go on. It's the, it, it's subtext, mm. which is what you've just said. Working with text, which is another word for plot, action. Yeah. And a visual, a visual mm. context. Breaking Bad is full of those. Yeah. And it's really well structured because of that. So nothing is in isolation. So that lovely, his lovely brother-in-law, whose name's gone out my head. Yeah. That character, he was just marvellous. He was working for the police. He was marvellous. Yeah. Everything he did when Walter wasn't in the scene, you were very aware. He subtextually linked to Walter. So the audience is going, oh, my God. And that's what I call the macro view. So the macro view, the bigger picture, we're all going, oh, no, don't do that because Walter's going to find out or, oh, you know, that's that's what you're looking for as mm. somebody who's storytelling in series drama, driving through the subtext. So at nobody in TV series is disconnected, even though in some cases they're not all, in many cases, they're not, Although in that case they are, but they're not all linked through blood or through family. Oh no 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 no! It, they, it's Sopranos. You could have a one of the hitmen could be bungling the job, so you know that's going to give Tony yeah. a headache. So that's yeah, the point. Gonna, that's the point. Yeah, yeah. What the, the other thing I say to writers is: what happens now? What happens next? Yeah. And as a result of that, the TV is constantly doing that, creating those peaks across the arc. And and it, it's there's two things going on. There's the effect and there's the affect. So there's like the verb, mm. like I am making an effect on you by physically doing this. Yeah. And then there's the noun. What does that look like? 
So it's that that's what you're doing in TV. And in a, in a way, is that is that sort of that makes me think then it's it's sort of avoiding the scenes which are just simply meanwhile something else is going on. I hate those sort of scenes. <laughs> Honestly, if you work with me, I'd be like red line, no, because it's not doing its job. Yeah, the yeah, scene yeah. Isn't, isn't earning its keep there. Mm. It's just, why are we doing this? This is what film is full of. Those sort of, I call them homework scenes. It's like a journeying thing you've got to do. You feel the pressure to show this person getting out the car, crunching across the gravel. Oh, Christ. You know, I, in TV, we'd only be crunching across the gravel if it was subtextually driven. Mm. <laughs> If if after the crunch we knew what she was going to get when she won't open that door, mm. or you know why are we looking at light hitting a doorknob? You do that in film all the time. Light hitting doorknobs. What is the point of the light hitting the doorknob? A lot of the time in film it could be because it's just a really nice filmic shot. In TV it means oh my god that doorknob's going to twist in a minute, mm. which is why we've got the light on it. <laughs> it's like and who's behind the doorknob? You know, and you will have set that up as the writer because you have juxtaposed a scene earlier mm. where subtextually we now know he's on the way, although the woman in the room does not know. So it, it, it that that's what we're doing. In if I could just sort of let you do a, a quick sort of flash of your your life working in TV and stuff. What's a what's a consistent from day one with your penny with a penny dropping for you and to this day in terms of developing drama for TV? What came to me when you said that was connection. Okay. Because I'm at the end of the day, structurally, it's got to work in a connective way. Mm. Those scenes we talk about, they're never in isolation. They're always connective. It's the connective tissue mm. that links those scenes is what overall we, the audience, will be engaged with and therefore we will make connection with. Right. Okay. So really... The, the the thing that's never changed is that thing I learned really early on mm. when I was on EastEnders. It was like, don't say anything, don't do anything, don't show anything unless you're going to get a human connection because that's what we're about. Okay. We want to reach through the screen and go, oh, feel this now. Go on. <laughs> because in a minute, you're going to be feeling this. Well, and do you you're know the one, the writer, in control of that. And th- that's a lovely segue then to my next question, which is, and and I would I would have I would have guessed this if I'd met you before I read the book, but having read the book, then met you. Um, there's, it's a very much. It feels like a, when I'm reading your book, it feels like a, even though it's you talking to me, I feel like there's a it's a dialogue, like you're 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 opening a dialogue with us. You're not just giving us a bunch of instructions. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, yeah. So where, where yeah. what, what's your, what's your what's your logic there? Because that's that's a really nice it's a really nice approach to you know because often instructional stuff and guides and stuff tend to be a bit like you know clunk click on every trip you know what I mean but like this one yeah I know I sound a bit sort of hippie now but <laughs> the point let the let point the no, is, let the I, northerner go let the northerner go and be hippie go on yeah yeah it's just a patchouli I can't stand <laughs> but the bottom line is it's just I absolutely care is the thing. Mm. You know, I really do. I care about the way we tell stories and about how they're told. I am passionate about it. And I think that's, once you find the thing that you're good at, Mm. you know, I write myself, but I'm really rubbish. I'm not a rubbish writer. I'm a good writer. But I'm I'm actually quite rubbish at doing it because it's very singular and it's an isolated occupation Mm. a lot of the time. Yeah. What, what, What I am really good at and I'm always for going for what you're good at, is literally teaching and showing and being part of it. So when I was producing, I led a team of people that had the same mindset. So you have to be innovative, but you also have to let people just go with what they want to do as well. Get the best around you and then let them do their thing. Mm. But what used to really inspire me, which is why the book is as it is, is that I genuinely felt that you know I'd found the place I needed to be. You know, I think mm. in life we all have to do that. We have to find the place we need to be in order to be the best version of who we can be. Yeah. And so when I want, I wrote that book because I wanted people to understand that it's it isn't it isn't rocket science. None of this is rocket science, but it's a specific skill base that you can get if you are around and surround yourself with a similar type of people. Mm. So. It's it's a language that you start honing, and and 
talking to 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 my people, my writers, my my people via these books, the two books. I mean, it sounds like I've got a library. I've got two books. <laughs> um, but you know, it's just it. What I want is to impart a sense of sheer joy, because it is when it's right, it's joyful. Mm. You know, working with the right people in the right atmosphere, doing the right project, it's joyful. You can't get better than that. And, and to be honest with you, I think that's it's almost like you you at every stage when you're developing as a writer, I've found that's that's the thing. You know, you get even when you're talking about a writing at a writing group level, you want to find people that you resonate yeah. with because the writing group would be a nightmare if you don't. And I've and I've been in plenty of them. So Oh God, yeah. The worst and I've I've worked with writers, you know, many different types of writers. And the worst ones are the ones that are so internal and precious. Hmm. So protective. I mean, I always think of the word fear. You know, that's what happens. Because mm. a lot of the time, you know, working with writers in the way I do, it is to do with exposure. It's to do with showing the person who you really are. Because writing is very, even if you're writing in genre, you know, if you're writing a complete fantasy, it's so revealing. Every decision you make is a reveal. So of the person you are. Oh, so, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. You know, I mean, I feel like the worst type of writer is that person that won't share. <laughs> hmm. No, no. I, I, I mean, I've, you know. I've, I've, I've met them. I've not worked with them in the capacity you have, but certainly there's there's the right friends who it's like it's like trying to get it prize it prize prize them from their hands. Not it isn't that precious. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Don't give me. It's not, you're not making some sort of jade weird thing for a Japanese select market. You know. But the bottom line is you're making drama that you want millions of people to engage with. Indeed. So let's get real about this. It's got to be collaborative. One last question before we move on to the three films. Um, can you can you explain to the layperson listening in who maybe hasn't worked in TV and doesn't know what a script editor is, can you kind of define the role of the script editor so people can understand that yeah. relationship between a writer and what ends up being on TV? Yeah, with pleasure. I loved script editing. I'd have done it forever, but I was hanked out of it. I was made to produce because I was actually really good. Because <laughs> that's the thing. They want good script editors make good producers. Script editors sit in sometimes the stormy water between what the producer wants for the show yeah. and what the writer wants to write. So you're sort of going taking the producer notes and sometimes on EastEnders you'd be doing this like round the clock it's really really fast turnaround so mm. you've got to get get the essence of what A wants the producer filter it through and then get the writer to do what the producer wants without the writer feeling that the writer has A failed or B lost their own agency <laughs> so it's you know it's a tricky and sometimes you just have to you know you just have to pull the big guns out and go, look, it's not my note, it's the producers and they're above me, so just do it. But most of the time, you don't do that. So it's diplomacy, it's an empathetic job. Mm. You have to be a pers people person. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I run a, I run a course, um, I have run a, uh, run a course since 2017, actually, very successful, popular course, how to script edit for television. Okay. And you, you can do this online, but you can do it in... So what I do every year, well, twice a year, believe it or not, I have people in this 300-year-old cottage <laughs> <laughs> all sitting around my table, and then people online as well, and I teach them how to script edit. So over four days. But, yeah. So then, with with that in mind, and a write, if a writer's about to have that relationship with a script editor, what would you... Not, not the, the, the specific personality types you describe in your book, but more yeah. more qualitative as a writer overall. What makes a good writer to a script editor? Somebody who will literally open their mind. Hmm. The worst writers are the ones that are like, I've got minds like metal traps that just, they've, they've got this thing, they've done this thing, they've done the, look, I've done what you said, I've, I've followed the outline, <laughs> you know. Hmm. There it is. There it is. Tell me I'm great. Tell me I'm great. They're the worst writers. What you have to do is go, open your mind, because 
it's not just my input if you're on a show it's it's several people's yeah. input but if you're not if you're one on one you know you have to just be open to notes is the thing and don't treat the note as a negative treat it as an opportunity <laughs> that's what no, that's, that's good so advice. important yeah, that's good advice. Yeah, particularly from somebody. But, but the, this is where I get a bit ang- we're well, not angry, but I just get a bit. Um, there's people in the industry out there who, who aren't even officially in the industry, I think, but just pretend they are. So don't go down a rabbit hole where you're trying to find a consultant or script editor to help you work your work up from scratch, and you don't know what you're doing. There's so many people out there that will sell you oil. These are snake oil salesmen. Yeah, they don't have the. They don't have. So look, look at what they've done. That's all I can say because it's so exposing. And, you know, there are people out there who will just take your money. But you just need to use people that have done the job. Well, look, from creation to pitch, how to write stories for TV that sell it out now from Creative Essentials. And you can buy that wherever you get books. I'll put a link in the show notes to some key places you can get it. And let us move seamlessly into three (laughs) films that have impacted everything in your adult life. Are you ready for this? Yeah, go on. Well, just for the person listening who hasn't done, who hasn't heard this before, um, Yvonne has given me three film titles. I'll do them in the order you've given me. And we're going to talk for five minutes at a time against the clock. And when the five minutes are up, we'll move on to the next film. Does that all make sense to you? Okay. Yeah, go on. Yeah. First off the bat, five minutes and counting, we've got 1981's American Wealth in London, written and directed by John Landis. So... Where are we seeing this one, Yvonne? What, what, what is this one? What's the lasting memory with this? Oh, my God. This is just it makes me feel so old, actually. But, you know, yeah. So I'm early 20s. I mean, it's really, really hot in London, mm. which is where I am. I hate the heat. I'm a ginger. I was born on Christmas Eve. I've got skin like a milk bottle. I just don't want to be there. Went into the cinema on my own, and it just happened to be this film. And it just blew me away. The reason I love it is that it was the first time, this is before I got into telly proper. Mm. Uh, it was the first time I realized that you could use music to be just as evocative as you would visuals and dialogue in a okay. film. Okay. I don't know whether you've seen the film, Stuart. I've seen yourself. it lots of times. Oh, right. Well, you know, the use of Blue Moon is mm. just so wonderful. It just cuts against everything in the film. Mm. And the other thing I loved about it, it was just how gory and scary it was, but just that you never felt like you were watching a horror film. Because I wouldn't have gone in. I would not have seen that film. If it was billed as horror, I would not have gone in. Because it's not my thing. I wouldn't do it. Mm. I loved it because it's character-driven, because it's essentially this wonderful sort of, irreverent tone you know where Mm. our lovely central character keeps meeting his gorgeous friend who gets horrifically murdered and eaten by this werewolf and then just sort of rots Mm. and periodically rots throughout the film until his jaw is literally the flesh is hanging off his bone and he's just like hi and i've never seen that done at that time anyway Mm. i mean it was it was a good device wasn't it it was basically like his own it was like playing his, you had you had his id in the shape of... Oh, nice. I never sh- thought of that. In the shape of his friend. I wasn't as clever as you when I was in my 20s. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as a writer, you're always looking for a device, aren't you? And you get, and, and, yeah. and that was, and it enabled, us, it enabled you to have a conversation with a muddled mind through the ghost of... Totally. Oh, I love that. Yeah, brilliant. That's exactly what was happening. Uh, take it away, Stuart. That's exactly what was happening with my favourite film. <laughs> No, but the other thing was Jenny Agatha. Yeah. Was she ever that young? Yes, she was. <laughs> and um, she just looked so great in it as well. And and I love the subtlety of it. Her story, you know, the, the, the nurse that helps him out. Mm. You know, if it was TV, I would, I'd have gone to town on her arc. Because yeah. oh, the other thing I didn't say earlier, it's all about arcs. Yeah. But yeah, just, just, you're plotting that arc across. I love the fact that it was geographically really clever and interesting like the geography was a character in it in the film you know the wild moor you know and 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 the creaky pub sign and i'm sure these are things these are tropes that that are used now in films all the time but at the time i I just thought it was all so new it just yeah i think i think it it, it sort of it it licked to to to, it literally nailed the trope to the mast of the dart stopping mid-flight you know that whole that idea of you and i walking into a stranger's pub 
and them looking at you. You know, that was it nailed that trope and therefore become yeah. the signifier of it now, I think. Yeah, yeah. And and then, you know, going to London and that whole sequence where he's, he locks himself out. Um, you know, it's it's a while since I've seen it, but it's still like seared in my brain. Do you now. remember do you remember what cinema you went to see it in at all? On that yeah, hot day in it London? It would have been it would have been the Odeon in uh in Leicester Square. Oh, really? So what do you remember of yeah. Odie in Leicester Square in the early 80s? What's what's it like then compared to now? <laughs> Very smelly, actually. Not great on the clean, but, you know, I think they probably didn't think many people were mad enough to go to the cinema on a really hot summer's day. Well, they were like, but what, point, there's a but, mad ginger girl in the front row, and that's about it. <laughs> but, but you point to something that that was, you know, until the late 80s when we started to see what, you know, the, the multiplex thing that was copied from America. Yeah. The idea of clean and air so. conditioning was was an alien concept yeah. to British Absolutely. cinemas. Absolutely. Well, to British life, I yeah. think. Um, and, and you're right about the, 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 um, about the nurse character because she, she ends up having a key role in the end, even though it's, yeah. it's, it's supposedly about a man transforming in and out of... Oh, and there's that other moment towards the end of the film and he's been you know, hounded. I can't quite remember the sequence now, but he's in a bed of straw and he's looking up and he's like, Ugh! and he's just, you know, coming out of being a werewolf. No, no, he is a werewolf. He's still a werewolf. But we know that he ju- there's just no way back. He can't not be a werewolf. He's yeah. never not going to be able to... Well, waking up, waking up naked him. in the London Zoo and the animals not being... That's the one I'm getting confused with. That's a brilliant minute as well. And there's our <laughs> first five minutes, Yvonne. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that. Good, good. That's always that's always a good thing to say in the middle of a podcast. Um, <laughs> so moving swiftly along, your second choice on your list is 1992 Strictly Ballroom, written and directed by Baz Luhrmann, although there are a few more, couple more writing credits on there alongside him, but let's say it's written and directed by him. Where where are you seeing Strictly Ballroom? Who who are you seeing with? Why, why is that one an important film for you? Oh, my God. I actually can't remember where I saw Strictly Ballroom. I probably did see it with friends in the early nineties. Mm. So I was I was on EastEnders at that time. Yeah, no, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. No, I was still nineteen ninety two. Did you say nineteen ninety two? It is nineteen ninety two. Yeah, yeah. I might have seen it in the middle of that of the nineteen nineties. In which case, I just started at Granada Television. Oh, okay. So what I was doing there is. The thing with Strictly Ballroom is I absolutely loved it. It just gave you a sense of a whole world that you didn't know about ballroom, you know, because Strictly Strictly Come Dancing wasn't done and, you know, it Strictly wasn't a big thing, obviously, yeah. in those days. And so it's, it's an area that I knew nothing about. And I suppose I hate it when straight women say, oh, I'm just a gay, a straight woman trapped in a gay man. <laughs> but the the point is, it did appeal to my camp side, which I yeah. do think I've got. Right. And I absolutely loved the camp of it. And I loved the heightenedness of it. Mm. I loved the fact that you really believe these characters were real, mm. but actually they were like cartoon almost, um, which was interesting. And I, I loved the use of the music as well. And obviously the whole visual aspect, but... Thinking about series television, which is why I think I liked it mm. very much when I started when I first saw it, is that I was being sort of in, in, introduced to the world of series storytelling at the same time. And even though this was a film, I could see that this could be where you would serialize. You could serialize this core group of characters going through. Mm. And, and 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 nowadays I would call that the backdrop, the macro the macro view, which is the whole world, political and sometimes very nasty and potentially dark, of ballroom dancing, against which you've got these heightened cartoon-esque characters. But running through, I would call that the narrative through line, is that love affair, that 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 ugly duckling transformation uh, storyline of the girl with the guy. Yeah, because I mean, bottom line, that's what it is, isn't it? But then, but then in, yeah. in 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 like you say, you talk about the heightened character element of it. It's that ability to take a setup which is on the face of it unimportant and make everybody in the film treat it like it's the most like we're like yeah. we're talking about World War Three. We're talking about a dance competition, yeah. aren't we? But but then you yeah. get drawn into it. I think I think what's it oh, called? Yeah, um, 
what's he called? Uh, that that was done well with uh, Chazelle's um, Whiplash, which is about a guy learning to jazz drum that becomes... Actually, yeah, that's a very good film. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I love Baz Luhrmann. I just love everything he does. I think he's just a brilliant storyteller. Do you, is there a particular scene that stands out for you in, uh, in Ballroom? Um, so there's this thing, and I used to try and do it, because okay. when <laughs> me and my friends, when we had a flat in London, we had laminated floors, and we used to try and do the Strictly Ballroom sliding on your knees. <laughs> so there's... <laughs> I think it's, yeah, it's... This the, the Australian gorgeous actor guy, guy thing, who plays the dancer, the gorgeous dancer she falls in love with, who does the the whole ballroom thing mm. um, with her. Oh, I'm really being bad. I can't remember the name. Um, but he comes, it comes left of screen and mm. he slides in on his knees like that and it's at speed and he stops and then the whole thing stops and then his lovely little frilly things on his shoulders go... And then the dust settles and you're like, <laughs> that's a moment. It's a little bit like, you know, sex, but just in pictures. I was going to say, I mean, in a way, though, that's that's what dance dance enables you to sort of do, is to do sex yeah. with your clothes on. I mean, you think of like dirty yeah. dancing and and even, you know, the other, the other, the other flash dance and various other things. Yeah, it's yeah. A, it's it's because it's a because it's about the movement of the body and it's about the movement of the body that we wouldn't but, normally do. There's that, there's that scene, but actually my fave fave is the, um, so there's, there's the cuckolded, put upon, slightly awkward, geeky husband role in Mm. this. He's got a heart of gold, but he's not really, he's what I would call, if he was a series story, I'd say, he doesn't drive narrative. Oh, anyway, he's dancing on his own in spotlight. Finish your thought, finish your thought. Right, he's dancing on his own because he doesn't think anyone's watching in the spotlight, which is left on when everyone's gone home, and he's just doing this beautiful dance. And he's a bit, he's got a bit of a paunch. Oh, but he's like a little gorgeous swan in his own little light. I love that moment. Dancing, dancing when nobody's watching. Exactly, literally doing that. Right then, your final choice, Yvonne. Yeah. We are going to 1987, written and directed by Bruce Robinson, the absolute stone cold classic comedy with Nail and I. Stone cold. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's a thing of beauty, isn't it? Mm. Even now. Without it's a doubt. It's just the best thing ever. I mean, you know, Richard E. Grant, did he ever really best that? No. No one's ever told him because he's a nice man. But Richard, <laughs> you didn't best it. You know, and I, I think what I love about that film, not least because I probably saw it with the love of my life, who's no longer around. So I remember that period, you know, yeah. and it was all just like anything can happen. Like the late 80s, anything can happen. Mm. And I had no idea I was going to get into telly and all this. I had no idea at that time. But I remember just sitting there and being transported by this film. Not least because it was genuinely funny, but it was so driven through the heart. You know, you felt so hard for Withnall. He was such a twat. <laughs> you're allowed to swear on this thing. Sorry, you are. You're yes. not. You are. Oh. <laughs> but he was. He was such just up his own arse, wasn't he? He was just, and you think, oh, just stop it. Just stop it. Otherwise, you're never going to be. The thing you're never going to make you make it because you're just your own your your own worst enemy. Subtextual, loads of subtext in it, and it never it never really addresses why they stay together. Like the logic from the very start is they should just go their separate ways, but I know they appear to be, for better or for worse, each other's lifeline. True, yeah. Because with you know, Nail, I mean, without an was... audience, he'd be talking to the wall, wouldn't he? Yeah. Now, that was the thing, though. He was erudite. He was cleverer. He was mm. better, actually, than the eye character. Mm. He was better at what he did. He just wouldn't bloody well compromise, and he wouldn't bottle down, and he wouldn't be collaborative. Do you think, I mean, you know, the- thinking about it now as you're talking about it then, do you think that was almost, in a way, that was a little bit of the class divide between McCann's character yeah. and Grant's yeah. character? I, I actually think so, yeah. I I agree with that. I never thought of it like that, but yeah. Yeah, 
Because I mean, so sixties Bohemia was was a revelation. You know, this idea of yeah. absolute people just doing bugger all and and yeah, and, and, all. and getting by. You know, and obviously, they're, they're, but also having absolutely no comfort style. I mean, that flat, God, it was brassic, wasn't it? That it was Baltic. That flat, you could tell in the scenes where there's no heating, and he's got that heat rub on because he's just freezing. Well, it's I mean, I'll, I'll always remember the 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 what you do, and he's, he's he's eating coffee like he's a bowl of yeah. soup. Yeah. Yeah, because actually, yeah, all right, we give the right to be bohemian. We want to be, we don't want to earn a normal, we don't want to dig a hole in the road. We're artists, but God, we're suffering. We're really suffering. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of it, really. It was almost, it, 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 it gave you that, I guess, nihilism that comes from it in the end, because yeah. if you produce nothing, you, you're not, you're doing nothing. You are nothing in a way. And Exactly, yeah. And it's that wonderful scene when he's sort of, doing the best Shakespeare to the wolves in Regent's Park, and you're like, oh, God. He's just throwing it away. He's just throwing it away. You know what I mean with the umbrella? Mm. And he's just, sta- oh, my God. It's such a great... See, the thing is, in film, uh, sorry, in TV, what I would call that, yeah, that scene when he's talking to the wolves and he's basically quoting the best Shakespeare ever, is it's, it's a set piece. Now, in film, they would call that, you know, like anything that's... Um, uh, a set piece is to do with action in film, yeah. but in TV, it, it, I've 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 made this up my own way, and it's in this book. But it's to do with the three things: the subtext, the text, and the visual context. Those three things mm. all coming together, and in a way, if you see that one scene, it sums up all of with Nor and I. No, it does. It does, and but it also manages to be still laugh out loud funny. Like this, I know. The, the absurdity of a man with two shopping bags on his feet. It's yeah. such a, it's just a sight gag, isn't it? It's not, it's not even yeah. that sophisticated, but at that point, yeah. it's just perfect. It sort of just adds to the overall absurdity. Of and and there's, there's elements like that all the way through. Like the lovely, um, the gay guy, the awful uncle thingy. Uncle What's Monty. Actor? Richard Griffiths. Uncle Monty. Richard Griffiths. I mean, I bloody love him in that film. <gasps> Go on, finish your thought there. You love him in that film because? Oh, just because. Doesn't he play the most scary gay in a, such an unscary way? I mean, potentially, he was really it was, horrible. He was a predatory character, yes. That was definitely the Totally predatory. The but the way it's played, and then he's just really annoyed with the cat. And just all of that. I just loved him in the film. Well, look, we have come to the end of our three films that have impacted everything in adult life. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on American Wolf in London, Strictly Ballroom, and Will Nail I. If I could be so bold as to ask you one more question, because there was one thing I meant to ask that I forgot when we were talking about your book. So I'm just going to add this in <laughs> at the yeah. end as a kind of epilogue. You talk, yeah. you, you, you have, a, you have a, a really clear section which is about the importance of the first 10 pages and what we're doing right. when, when we're in that pipe, when we're writing that pilot and what the purpose of the first yeah. 10 is. And, and, and th- there, therein lies some resonance with film for sure. It's like you want the reader to want to read on in a way, but do you want to, do you want to unpack a little bit there about what you, you as a script editor, what you're trying to get the writer to do with that first 10? 10 pages in my book, although I don't like to be prescriptive with my writers, is Mm. the end of Act 1 in Mm. a five-act structure. Okay. You want, at that point, to have introduced everybody that's going to carry any narrative weight, anyone that's going to push the plot beyond into Act 2. Because remember, in television series, we start, and that minute one, you're building to the action, which is going to develop, peak in the midpoint, an end in a pilot, but bump into two, which mm. bumps into three. This is non-stop now to the end of Ep 6. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is what we're doing. We're setting it. It's a, donima, a domino effect. So what you're doing in that first 10 pages, in that first act, is basically establishing to an, an, an audience without, without them having to do homework, without them making them feel like they're working, you have to say, here are the people, Here's the narrative that they are jump-starting. In film, you call it the inciting incident. I call mm. it the jump-start, where you're jump-starting the story engine, which mm. isn't going to stop 
until we get to the end of ep six, which you don't know that yet, audience. You're just looking at ep one. Yeah, so yeah. I'm telling you that these first 10 minutes are going to be the ones that you will remember when you've watched all 60. Mm. So it, it's to do with setting up plot. It's to do with establishing character. And in my book, plot and character are the same thing. Yeah. So you, you, the character is doing something because of what they feel inside, subtextually driven. I was blown away when I went back to episode one, season one of Breaking Bad. And because you have literally a family party scene. But not only that, it, I think it took me three series to realise that the DAA's wife, the sister, is the sister yep. character, was all about purple. And I'm like, they didn't do it in the first... And then in the first episode, she's dressed in purple. And like, even yeah. that note was in the first, you know... I know, I love it. I love the way he thinks, Vince Gilligan. I'd love to have been in, a, in his writer's room. I'd have mm. just died for that job. Mm. I mean, he just so knows what he's doing. And the other person who I need to... Not that she needs me to boost her ego at all. Not that she's got an ego, but she doesn't, certainly doesn't need me to boost her name or credence in the industry. Sally Wainwright. Yeah, she yeah. is a master, a master at what I teach and try and do myself. She, mm. I was in the same room with her for, for years at Granada. We yeah. had the same language. But honestly, to your listeners out there, if you are thinking, can I write TV series? Go back and look at the two seasons of Happy Valley because nothing is better, nothing in terms of structure. But but in t- in terms of your first ten pages point, the opening sequence where we meet Rebecca Lancashire for the first time is just everything about that character in a nutshell. There's nothing. Yeah. There's nothing that you don't get from that sequence in the plate with, with the kid and the swing and stuff. That exactly, exactly because because she doesn't. She thinks like I do. You don't say anything. So actually, yeah. You don't say anything unless in a scene in television, unless it has an impact on the next scene or mm. has had a connection with the one before. Nobody is doing anything in isolation. None of it is, here's the word, extraneous. You can't you can't have anything that is not connected to something. Otherwise it goes. It goes. Actually, well, I think I need to say, were there three seasons of Happy Valley? Or am I getting confused now? I think there was. There might have been. I think there's three. There's definitely there's more three. than two. No, there's three. There's three. Of course there's three. There's three. And also because she did this brilliant thing where she had a massive gap before she wrote the third one because she wanted Ryan to be old enough. Yeah. And and to answer you, I was, my wife watched it and I didn't. So I watched the final season first. Right. And then went yeah. back and watched the first two. And it was... And it's it's testament to the, how brilliant it is that that didn't knowing where it ends didn't but stop you enjoying honestly, the drama. Stuart, everything she thought of in that first season, everything she was doing in that first season, honestly, although she hadn't actually physically written the third, yeah. she was aiming for that. Yeah, that's what she was doing. I mean, Vince Gilligan said the same about Breaking Bad. He he, he never knew he'd get the five seasons, but he always knew it was going to be the five. That was what true. He did. Yeah. And I, you can tell that in this in this in the storylining of it. Well, look, Yvonne, we have come to the end of the podcast. It just gives me to say thank you very much for being on the Britflix podcast. Your book, From Creation to Pitch, How to Write Stories for TV That Sell, is out now. And it just gives me to say thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, Stuart. I really had a nice chat. I've enjoyed it.